Good afternoon, everyone. I am Anne Havmeyer, Director of the Norfolk Library, and it is my pleasure to welcome you today and to introduce New York Times best-selling cookbook author, educator, podcaster, and Norfolk Book Group leader, Mark Scarborough, and Dr. Genevieve Gagne-Hawes, the in-house editor at Writer's House. First, a quick word about this webinar, which is being recorded. Mark and Genevieve have agreed to answer questions following their discussion. So for those of you who have not attended a webinar, look for the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and feel free to ask questions during the discussion. You can also vote for questions you might see there, which will move them to the top of the list. Now, a few words about Mark, if I can keep them to a few. Mark has long been associated with the Norfolk Library, in particular as leader of our popular book group, now going into its 12th year. But this is only a small part of what he does. He has co-authored with Bruce Weinstein more than 30 cookbooks, has made countless national television appearances, and hosts three successful podcasts. I actually love what was written about Mark on Macmillan's website, and I quote, a former academic, Mark is sometimes snarky because he's ridiculously innocent in the marrow. He reads Dante for fun and hangs out in art museums on sunny afternoons. He's a bemused Texan in snowdrifts, a dumbfounded progressive and a self-confessed culinary snob. He still teaches literature on the side and leads a raucous book groups at Connecticut libraries. We are lucky to be one of those libraries and to have many of his cookbooks in our collection and his recently released memoir, Bookmarked, which we will hear more about today. Dr. Genevieve Gagne-Hawes is the in-house editor at Writer's House, one of the world's largest literary agencies. In her time at Writer's House, Dr. Gagne Hawes has edited numerous New York Times bestsellers and Reese's Book Club picks. And in 2003, she plucked Stephanie Meyer's worldwide YA phenomenon, Twilight, from the submission pile. Her editorial work is focused on helping authors grow their narratives and develop their unique voices with an eye toward the ever evolving commercial market. Welcome to you both, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Thanks for that, and thanks for that nice introduction, and thank you, Genevieve, for being willing to be part of this conversation today. It is since, such a pleasure. Since you were so intimately involved in the process of my memoir, Bookmark. So I'm going to let you start off and Excellent. give it to you. All right. My first question was just a broad one. So for people curious about how you came to write memoir after cookbooks, just what was the root of the project for you? Like, why did you decide you wanted to jump genres and tell your story? Um, I wanted to tell the story, but I didn't know how to tell it. And so I started trying to tell it as a novel and it just wouldn't connect. I couldn't connect to the character uh, who was me, but I couldn't connect to the character of this kid who is preaching the gospel at county fairs. And I, I tried it in several different ways and it didn't make any sense. So I, I got scared of writing a memoir. I jumped it out to fiction. I jumped it out to first person fiction. None of it landed. And I finally came back to writing a memoir. And it just, it uh, slowly took over, I guess, like it does everybody, it slowly took over my life. It's, and it, I, we had a very active publishing career at the same time. And yet I thought that I had a story, God, it sounds so, um, Honey, I thought that I had a story that was my own and was unique and that could be told in a way that showed my profound and at times psychotic involvement with literature. By the time it came to me, so I came on partway through the process, you'd already completed a full draft mm -hmm. and 
sort of found the format that it still has. So it was by that point titled, bookmarked, same subhead, mm -hmm. same general heft about your encounters with the great works. Mm -hmm. But when did that come to you as the angle you wanted to take on it, that it became clear? Yeah. When did, when did what? Help me know. When did what? The, the, the angle that bookmarked? Yeah, the great books of Western literature effing up your life. When did that become the lens that, that you saw as the way in to narrowing what? down the story? It, it was the way in because it is books have had the profoundest effect on me and they it was the way into this story which actually was was really I think how do I say this it's a kind of double story it's it's actually the story of being an adopted kid yeah. and trying to figure out the search for home and this is probably intrinsic to all adopted kids whether they get in a home with a good fit or a bad fit but my search for home has been the overwhelming quest of my life to find a place where I felt like I belonged and it's not that books offered me somehow a place to belong the way they to a lot of people it's that I somehow came to this this conclusion that books were alternate timelines. And if I read enough, I would find the actual timeline I belonged on and not the timeline I was currently living. And it just became this overwhelming passion. And I think, I could be wrong about this, but I think that's a lot of people's stories, not about William Blake and William Faulkner, but I mean, so many of us have to jettison the stories we've been told in order to tell the stories of ourselves, And it, whether it's the stories you've been told by our parents, our spouses, our lovers, our siblings, whoever, we've all had stories whispered Iago-like in our ears over the years. And we have to learn how to pull out of those stories in order to tell our own story and to authentically connect to a story that we can tell. And so I, th I think that I wanted to explore that. And the only way I could possibly explore that was through Faulkner, James, Bronte, <laughs> Blake. 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 <laughs> Blake, especially yeah. William Blake. Yeah, I mean, what, seriously, what, what arty 19-year-old kid doesn't fall for William Blake? But I fell in a particularly <laughs> hard and terrible way for William Blake. You fell harder than most. Most, yeah. right. Yeah, given the fact that I spent the night with him, I, I, in, a, in some kind of delusional state, I did fall harder than most. One thing that we definitely talked about when we were going through earlier drafts was that it felt to me as an editor when we started out that you were writing kind of about the process of reading, but not about yourself. And so, or, or the focus was on the books and not about you yet. And so one of the things we had to do to get to kind of the heart of the memoir was move it from the authors to your own story and that theme you were just emphasizing about searching for home and it required some awkward edit letters it's always interesting working on memoir because it's so personal and i would have to say you know you need to talk more about your marriage you need to talk it feels like you're hiding from us in the books especially mm -hmm. i know we went over the henry james in venice section a good amount and a lot a lot and so I wanted to ask about that. Like, I really pushed you on to, to go into these uncomfortable places. And what was that experience like? I know what it, a little awkward for me, but as an author, how does it feel to get reports that are like, you have to write about these very hard things? It was very hard at first. Um, and it was diversionary that that chapter that you're talking about, Henry James in Venice, is kind of this... Uh, a gr it's all turning around James's portrait of a lady, but I had, but I was using portrait of a lady as a shield, the plot of portrait of a lady as a shield to not talk about myself and to talk about the book rather than me. And so you're right. I had, you kept saying to me, you have to talk about the sensation of writing or the, of re sorry, of reading or your effect of reading on you or even in your body. And I at first had no idea how to do that. I had no clue. It, it totally escaped me. And um, you're going to laugh because you and I have never talked about this before, but um, <laughs> uh, I got some advice from someone else and I took it. And one of the, the, the part of the advice was literally spend a lot of time unclothed. 
spend a lot of time walking around your house naked and figure out how to feel i know it's ridiculous and I figure out like how to it. sit and watch tv naked and you know be naked and get comfortable being naked and it was honestly part of the way that i figured out how to write the book is that i kind of realized okay the sensation of sitting and watching tv naked is a similar sensation to trying to pull out very dark and deep parts of yourself and put them out on a page. It's a similar clicking clock inside of you. It feels the same. It feels like you kind of don't want to be doing this and then you're doing this, but ah, uh, and then you kind of get the heroic vibe. I'm doing this. I'm sitting here naked. And then <laughs> and then you you back away again. And it's that, it's that um uh that vibe that goes on with it that helped push me into figuring out where books lived inside my body mm. and and not where they lived up in my head uh, and it's, and funny, that, it's so sorry. funny to go back to that being such a challenge almost because the finished draft of bookmarked is so physical like you really capture the places that you are the way your body felt at the time change like the way living in different parts of the country affected you physically mm. and so I don't know I may have to use that as editorial advice going forward if I feel like mm. someone is holding back I'm gonna be mm. like you tried getting naked <laughs> just get <getting> naked <laughs> and try being naked for a long time I, I've been doing a lot of reading of, uh, of narrative anthropologists the burgeoning now field of narrative anthropology and uh, we were talking about this in a middle march class that I teach uh, I was talking about this this week and these these cultural narrative anthropologists claim that there are three basic stories there's the body in pain the body in pleasure and the body in motion and that those are the three essential, like across Edo, Japan, and 18th century British lit. And those are the three basic plot structures. And I think for sure, Bookmark falls into the body in motion because it's it has this very sequential movement through place in it, through Waco, Baylor University, through Wisconsin, through New York, it, 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 and it ends up in New England. It, it, I've clearly designed, written my life out as a series of scenes in places. When I went to Austin, Texas, actually went to both Waco and Austin when we were editing the book together, because it was a process that went on for about a year, I think we edited together. I think so. And in both of them, I was like, wow, it's just like bookmarked. I'd be standing <laughs> thinking of, of your book. Yeah. Mm, um, I don't know that I think that bookmarked is a great, uh, a great I don't think the Waco Tourist Board would hold bookmarked <laughs> up as, a, as a reason to come to town. Uh, <laughs> what do I say? I say something about the Baylor English faculty protected the altar of literature by blowing out the candles. And I just... <laughs> I don't think they'd be actually too thrilled by that, but what can With I tell you? Browning Library and there's the stuffing forks or whatever. Yeah, the yeah. stuffing spoons, right, because the Armstrong, the largest collection of Robert and Elizabeth Barrett Browning paraphernalia is at Baylor University, and I don't necessarily mean manuscripts, I mean their silverware and their tablecloths. <laughs> very strange, very, very strange. Okay. So, so I have a, que I have a question yeah, for oh, you. Yeah. So you... Yeah. And th this is a question for you as your job as in-house editor at Writer's House, and it, it relates to Bookmark too. but surely many a query and many a partial and many a full manuscript goes over your desk. And what is it that you see as a common pitfall or pratfall that a memoirist might take as a common problem in their book? I would say the number one thing that people trip up on is trying to include everything. And it was sort of why I asked how you came relatively soon in the process for me to the great works as the framework by which you were going to tell your story. Because so many people, when they sit down to write memoir, at least the ones that I see that are queried to us, present it as everything and the kitchen sink. It's everything that happened to them. There's this desire to be encyclopedic and incredibly truthful to every detail that they can remember. And what results is a story that doesn't have that body in motion feeling. You don't get the sensation of traveling with the person. You get bogged down in details that are 
important for memory and important, I always say important for family. I think a lot of memoir is almost most valuable as a document for family. But the memoir that elevates that and that becomes bigger opens itself up immediately to a reader. It says, here's something in my story that's also something in your story. And that was something with Bookmarked. I remember when you nailed the last draft, I wrote to you like, this is teaching me things about my own relationship with books and how I have read over the course of my life. And mm -hmm. so when a memoir stands out, it's doing that. It's picking up something in an individual life and almost putting aside all the other details. Like there's a lot of stuff that comes out of a memoir necessarily mm -hmm. to focus that part that connects with the reader. Yeah, because, um, you know, uh, yeah, there are parts of my life that are not in bookmark. There's a, that, that uh, yeah, I, I, I was a musician for a while. I, uh, I did a crazy, crazy car trip from Texas to Rio de Janeiro, but that's not in there because it's not lens through the great books. And it, it would be just a rehearsal. It's great dinner party fair. Yeah. But it's not stuff that, that, in order to arc the story. I think that that was something that I had to learn and I didn't know. I, I thought I got narrative arc until I tried to write my own memoir. And I realized that a lifetime of being analytical about Henry James and Charlotte Bronte did not lead to the skills necessary to build an arc, a narrative, a narrative shape to it. I, I don't think I knew that. So I, I said this to someone the other day, and they said it's the difference between being a theater critic and being an actor. Mm. That just because you're a theater critic doesn't mean you can get up on the stage and act. It means you're a theater critic, and you may be very good at what you do. But I somehow just believed in my bones that because I knew how Jane Eyre worked, therefore I knew how narrative arcs work. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that was not the truth. And there was a long struggle of, uh, I, I think you remember this, that you were pushing me to go deeper and in, at one point in our working together. And instead I went wider and shallower and the book mm -hmm. grew to be 140,000 words and it grew out this way instead of this way. And it, it, because I, I was, I still didn't, I hadn't figured out that I had to knife that stuff up from just basically bone level. And I remember that being the hardest editorial letter because the previous draft, you had really narrowed in on the meat of your story. But then it was sort of what we were talking about before, the scenes that were remaining at that point were those really hard ones. It was really mm -hmm. like deep level stuff. And so I think the impulse sometimes when you're being pushed to tell a story that's so deeply personal is to move away from it. And your way is your storyteller. So it looped into all these like long extra stories about things. And so it was such a, I was like, oh, you were close. We got to get it back down. But, I remember that very well. I remember the letter that you wrote me, the email that came in and you know, I, we, Genevieve and I were working through my literary agent. So it would come to my literary agent and then to me. And I remember this and, and I remember that on my literary agent called me to kind of warn me that this letter was coming and that then it came and I, I was just kind of undone by it because I thought oh but I thought I was doing it but you're right what happened is I got discursive and digressive I you know I, I for lack of a better word got Faulknerian why use one <laughs> adjective when six will do uh, I, everything just got kind of blown up in the end the art the arc the, uh, the narrative arc got lost um inside the book itself, which is super hard. And I have to tell you that the stuff that, that we and that when I went back after that and cut, and a lot of the parts where you were very um, straightforward that this is not necessary to the story that you're telling, which are very, they still live in a document on my computer oh, because yeah. I, I couldn't get rid of them. I, I was, I thought, oh, I, I sweated over those words. Doesn't she see that that's, a quote from Dickinson and a quote from Eliot all woven up together. <laughs> you see how clever and smart that is? And I, I, I sweated over that. And I, I, 
I just looked at it the other day. That that folder still exists on my computer to this moment of all the bits that I had to cut out because, uh, man, you blood, sweat, and tears over that. Yeah. I think that's the h- hardest thing for me was, uh, I, I, I said this in, in another group a, a, a couple of weeks ago, but I think it was one of the hardest things for me is that I started out writing bookmarked because I wanted people to think how clever I was and how smart I was and how intelligent I was. And I wanted this document that would prove to the world that I was so smart. And instead, (laughs) it sounds like the most hackneyed thing I could say. Instead, I had to learn the hard way, story first. But it was hard. It was really hard to learn story first. That that I had to tell a story of, well, I guess chaos that chaos that calms down to domesticity. I had to le- <laughs> learn how to tell that story. And, and I always say, I feel like first that there should be a director's cut for books. That there should be a way <laughs> for you to get those drafts because everybody has one. I had one for my dissertation. Every author I know, I'm like save it in a Word document. Someday you can maybe use it again in something else. But it hurts so much to cut that stuff. But also it's story first and it's reader first because that's often, it's. you had asked about sort of memoir pitfalls. I feel like that's another one, like wanting to write a book that will preserve you in some particular way. So it's like the smartest or here's something I did that was so so significant and I want people to know about it. And the thing is, a memoir is like any other book in that respect. It's going to go out into the world and it will affect people the way it affects them when they read that, where they read it. And so that, like letting it go almost, I feel like is when Bookmarked opened up in a way, like it became much more about where people could come into your story instead of being hermetically sealed to preserve a particular image. Mm-hmm. But that- I did want to ask, what was the part that we cut that, that caused the most pain? What's the part of the document that you most wish you could have kept? Uh, I don't, I, I, I thought about this and I thought about what is there a part that I cut? And honestly, for me, and this is part of the cleverness thing, it wasn't actually any scenes. It was sentences that I thought were so, so damn smart. Mm. And I had been so clever to write the sentence that that, that just had to stick there. And I think that when we got toward the, the book um, is a lot about my adolescence and a lot about my t- 20s and early 30s. And as it gets into the cookbook career, it picks up speed. Once I meet Bruce, it starts to really pick up speed. And then well, it's about 50 pages and it's out. And I think that there were a lot of sections of writing about Bruce that got cut uh, because I was rehearsing the same thing. I was saying the same thing over and over and over again. I found this place. And it, it, as I've said a m- million times, Bruce is the only human I've ever felt at home with. And I feel this just sense of being with him is just being at home. And it's this overwhelming sense around him. And um, I, I, I think I was rehearsing rehearsing that a lot so of course I wanted to put in all kinds of stuff about our moving to New England and but that that, those bits that eventually got cut of leaving the city moving to New England or got pushed down to just paragraphs or two those bits hurt a little bit to, to remove but I think that I was doing what you were saying I was moving out of story and into journal into the things that happened to me and what we expect, what I, I hope the reader is expecting from the book is the quest for home. And it's already becoming apparent. We don't need to do this journey thing. It's, it's uh, someone asked me uh, 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 a couple of weeks ago, what's the difference between an autobiography and a memoir? Mm. And I explained it that I thought an autobiography was a proscenium stage where you, you know, the curtain and the, the proscenium, and that's an autobiography. You know, you the curtain goes up and you, it, Keith Richards said, Keith Richards tells everything he ever did. And yes, bizarre. I it is. <laughs> it's like, that's a brick of a memoir. 
Right. And there it is. You know, I don't know. Or Obama. It's just the proscenium, proscenium stage. Whereas if you're trying to write a more modern memoir, you're working on a thrust stage, the stage that goes out into the audience. And you have to learn to inhabit that space out in the audience, which is the only way I could think of when you kept pushing me. You've got to connect with a reader. You can't, yeah. you can't just connect with yourself. I kept thinking about this notion of how actors inhabit thrust stages how they inhabit out into the audience and what happens to them when they when they're out there in front of the audience not back here behind the safe proscenium where you're just presenting the moments of my life I, the, the, to me the great example of that is the year of living dangerously um mm -hmm. because my, she, she's so vulnerable and yes. she's so out inside the experience of of grief and loss um and i was going to say when you're thrust out on that stage the number one thing i think of is that you're exposed like that's the thing you're putting everything you did out there and you're not trying to affect how the reader perceives it or how the reader mm -hmm. judges you because they're mm -hmm. in reading a memoir like reading any book there's an element of judgment you're just letting it be out there on the stage mm -hmm. and accepting the vulnerability that comes with that and that's a big step in memoir. I feel like that's one of the scariest parts about writing one, or I would think it is. It, it is very scary. Um, I think I had practice with this with my shrink in Manhattan because uh, shrink junkie. And when I was with, <laughs> which is not in a memoir, there's no shrink no. in memoir. <laughs> um, and when I was in therapy for a while, we came to the conclusion, well, I came to the conclusion that I was running my therapy sessions based on her looks whether huh. she smiled or nodded or went hmm and you know ever the southern boy ready to please i would just go right there if it, whatever story i was telling you the minute she went hmm, hmm that would suddenly become the point and then i would drive toward that point because i, I it, it, it was reinforcing so the big breakthrough for me in for therapy was when we literally did traditional therapy and she sat behind me and I couldn't see her anymore. Oh, and yeah. she was silent. And we, I spent several weeks in dead silence in therapy because I, I didn't know how to talk. Was her back there? I, what, am I, what do I say? Without what the she, audience to kind of guide the way. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I think that that kind of prepared me to figure out how to be raw and bookmarked because it, it showed me that I can dig inside myself and find the places in myself that can create this story. And yet at the same time, I don't have to necessarily write this to please Genevieve or my literary agent or, 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 or other people who are reading the book around me, friends who are reading the book as it was being written around me, um, that I had to figure out how to write it out of myself. It's funny, it's a hard lesson to learn. It's a, it is. And it's something that only, I, I really think only memoirists have to deal with. Like, that's the other thing. Like, if you're writing a novel, you always have the layer of separation. These characters aren't me. I'm not these characters. Even if you're drawing on your life, you can say, it's not me. These are my characters. Whereas memoir, again, I was rereading it before our talk and just thinking about, like, all the people in your life that you capture so indelibly and these mm. character portraits that you draw and the portraits of books that you draw, but you give so much of yourself when you do that, because these are really intimate stories of your own perception of things and your most vulnerable moments. And was there any, any of those past moments, either a book or a person that when you were writing, it evolved or changed? I was thinking about this because some of them did shift over the drafts. Did you did, some, of the, some of the ancillary characters or the other characters yes. in my life around me. Um, the, uh, they, I think that the, what happens is that they concentrated. Um, I have a, uh, the, the woman in the book, Fiona, who's the artist who puts my life back together in Austin after I'm an English prof who has thrown all his books away and has I'm an English prof who doesn't own a book. And um, drag monks out of gay bars in your tiny car. Try, try, when I'm pulling the monks out of gay bars for my, for, to try to keep my job at the stupid university. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's in Austin. Uh, I, um, 
uh, that artist, I have a friend who knows this person and unfortunately that artist died before she could read them bookmarked and so she she is not around to have read it which i'm very sad about actually and she helped me put my balance together but uh, i was talking to my friend about her the other day and and my friend said you know i can just see the kind of sly wink she would give and the way she'd purse her mouth at the way you described her because of course she's concentrated um she was not just this crazy woman who blew squirrels out of trees with a 12 gauge <laughs> shotgun although she did do that so she's not just this crazy person who did the, this texan who blew squirrels out of trees she instead she was of course a much fuller and rounder and more uh adept person at negotiating the world but i had to concentrate her to make her to make her work in my story because what yeah. i need is this kind of catalyst for me to be able, she was a great reader. And we started in the book, we start, it's my way back to books. We start reading poetry over breakfast and she makes me go get the poetry volumes out of her completely disheveled library. Her library is just like chaos. And <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you can see- I was gonna say, much, unlike your beautiful library. <laughs> you can see how much I love chaos. And so, <laughs> Uh, so she, she um, would get those, I would retrieve those books and then we'd sit there and read poetry together. And it put my life back together again um, in a very specific way. And I needed her to, in the concentrated, what is that 10 pages that, that those scenes take? I needed her to, to be that catalyst, to read as that catalyst. So she's and it caricatured is too far concentrated is the right word for what happened concentrated to her is the perfect word and it's like the the most salient it's sort of what you're doing with your own life you can't include your time in a band you can't include the road trip you have to include the part that is most right for this story and for the arc that you chose to give to it it's very hard and i i i taught a memoir class here in Northwestern Connecticut a few years ago while I was writing Bookmarked, I was teaching a memoir class. And um, I caught this from people, this, uh, they didn't, they couldn't get into the story because they were so busy trying to worry about journaling the details. Yep. And so I kept saying, what's the story what's the story over and, over and i'm sure i was doing that because you were saying to me what's the story what's the story over and over again yes, I and i was turning back to them and saying it but i was watching them struggle with it too i think it's a very common and difficult struggle that people oh, have yeah. so i'm going to ask you a question given That's your good. job as in-house edit, uh, uh, editor at writer's house at the literary agency where i'm at and all the stuff that crosses your desk and i'm sure this is a question that a lot of people might want to know the answer to what is something that will cause you to absolutely not look at a manuscript you just won't look at it if, in any if, genre just in yeah, overall what, yeah yeah what causes you just to go oh no i can't do that there are some big red flags where it's like if it comes across as just unbearably sexist or racist or something which unfortunately mm. we get more than but that is the first and most obvious red flag there will be certain ones where i'm i i read it and think no that book won't won't be doing good work in the world or it's not work that i because a lot of the time i frame it as if we take this book out of this out of the submissions pile mm. i'll be editing it in a lot of cases so i'll be spending a year two years sometimes more with this book and do I want to be with this story for that long? So you look at it and you're like, if it pops with an attitude that's that seems really hurtful or there's really gratuitous violence and stuff, and obviously this is not in the memoir category, we're not getting too many of those, but for novels, those are the big things. Um, and stories that sound both clear and distinctive, those are probably the biggest things that I'm looking for when I pull something. It's not necessarily determinative of it getting rejected, but the ones that stand out to me most are, they know the story that they're trying to tell. And I think that part of the process can take, I mean, we worked over it and you worked over it in your memoir group. That part of the process is often so much of my editorial work that 
I like to see a book that's kind of leapfrogged it. I'm like, okay, then no, even if the plot's not fully, fully worked out, or if it's a mystery, even if the mystery, the ending seems too obvious, it it knows the story it's trying to tell. And and it's a different story because that's probably the other biggest one is that so many of the stories sound like other books. And we even get ones as a a classics person, you will appreciate this. We'll get things sometimes with titles like Portrait of a Lady. And I'm like, how do you not know that there's a book called Portrait of a Lady? Like you you got to Google your title, but that sort of thing, I, I, I don't know. And maybe it's residual snob from my own academia days, but sometimes I'll even... I, I try to, if I can, write like per slightly personalized rejection letters, and I'll be like, "By the way, your title is shared by another work. You may want to look into that." <laughs> but it's Jane Eyre. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, <laughs> you want to think about like your own story and like the what makes your story more distinctive. Those are the the things that helps stuff stand out. Mm, mm, mm. I I saw the other day on Twitter too somebody talking about that uh and i think that you and i both commented about this it was an agent with a thread i think an agent with a thread and she was talking about what she's looking for is that she as someone who that she feels is open to criticism that she doesn't feel when it comes in there's not a i'm not getting this exactly right but there's not a defensiveness Absolutely. But there's an yes. openness to being rewritten and to criticism itself and not she wants to see people who she thinks can stand up to yeah. to workshopping. I mean, even if they haven't workshopped their book. Um, but they'll be willing to take the feedback. And that has gotten so much more important because publishing itself has gotten so much harder to sell a book. Like as an industry, it's contracted. There's fewer publishing houses, fewer acquisitions. And so in almost every case, it's part, it's why my job exists. It's why a literary agency, which isn't necessarily focused on editing, the writer's house is a more editorial one and your agent is a wonderful editor, but um, it's why my, I edit now prior to submission to help books sell because it's so much harder to get through those, those hoops. And so going in, you have to be willing to be criticized and we'll sometimes have people who will get very upset about getting edits and I try to make them gentle and receptive and constructive. But even with that, sometimes if you're too locked on, you as an author, not, not you, Mark, but if you're too yeah. locked on to your story and you won't change it, your book will probably not get anywhere. And yet she got pushback on that thread. I was surprised on Twitter. She people did. were, yeah, not happy. Got <laughs> yeah. She got a lot of pushback. And yes, you're right. The publishing landscape has changed dramatically. And since um, editors basically don't have acquisition money anymore, and since editors basically have to figure out a marketing plan for a title rather than, you know, the old you know, the old uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald plan. It's just, it's just they have to work out an actual sales plan for what they're buying before they can even send it off to be bought by the house. It Things have to come in in a much cleaner state. Uh, we know this even in our cookbook world. I mean, even though we've had a very successful cookbook career, and so, uh, you know, at this point, we sell cookbooks off proposals which is a luxurious place to be, to be able to sell a cookbook off a seven page proposal and not have to write the book. But most things you have to write it. If, if, if I intend to make anything out of the fragments of a novel that are currently sitting on my computer, I know I have to write the whole thing. No one's gonna, nobody's gonna buy it on a partial or on three chapters, it, even if they're fabulous. It just no doesn't really it. happen anymore, unless you're someone who's, like your cookbook career, unless you have yeah. this many titles under your belt and you are proven, you know, you know what you're doing. You've, you've done it before. The, the genre switch is a, its own beast, though. The genre switch is its own beast, especially in publishing. And to jump from cookbooks to memoir was hard. It was a, it was a hard, long slog to get someone willing to pick it up. That. Like, what is that transition like for you? You know, we talked at one point in the editorial process about how some books are more threatening to than others. And you wrote about mm -hmm. this, and this is sort of one of the main threads in Bookmarked, is there were certain Blake gets inside your head. So what was that like going from a cookbook, which is obviously something, there's a more technical aspect, but 
at the same time, it's your personality, your voice that's helping make the cookbook work to, to the memoir. Like, what was that transition like for you? Well, it, it's especially strange in my life because Bruce is the chef and Bruce in our cookbook career. And Bruce and I make concept out some recipes together. We have a book, Do to Little Brown, in December. And um, we have talked about some of the recipes, but basically he's off on his own creating these recipes. And then I get, as I always say, I get what looks like a chicken walked in ink and walked across a piece of paper. <laughs> and then I, as his notes, and then I'm expected to turn that into a book, into an explanatory book. But it's still, especially in our career, it's still more reportage. It's still, I'm I'm rehearsing what he's done and I'm trying to explain what he's done in a DIY voice so that it makes sense, but is, you know, entertaining to read. You know, um, maybe I want to call an egg yolk perky, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's still, a, I have to basically follow the, the, the recipe that he has created. Um, and I can put some voicing in it or not. Writing my own book was a completely different experience. It, it was suddenly, I was, it was, it was that therapist behind me. I was suddenly on my own. And I felt very, to use the word we've already used, naked. I, because there is a solace or a safety for Bruce being in front of me. And I'm the second name in the career. So it's Bruce Weinstein and Mark Scarborough. So, you know, there's a kind of safety that he's out in front of me. Taking fire, almost. Yeah. <laughs> I like to think of him as my own private George Herbert Lewis, and I'm George Eliot back here, yes. and you know, like like she did. I'm sending him out in front of me into the world to send, and I'm standing back behind him. So <laughs> <laughs> I like to think of him that way. But but it was still, um, it was this overwhelming process, but also and hard. But also, I I, I told you this, and it, uh, it is the truth. I ran for it the moment yeah. your query letters would come back, your, your, I mean, your editorial letters would come back. The moment I would get them back in my hands, I, I would just be aching to get to my desk and do it. And sometimes we would be in the middle of cookbook production or I'd be in first pass or second pass or cookbook and there's no way I could do anything at that moment because I was locked into the production process. But it, it was intriguing and also, our cookbooks are all published by big New York houses. Um, and my memoir is published by a small art press. And I used to scream and complain that when you sell to a New York house, you enter the 5,000 page procedure manual and the house determines what happens, you know, and, I, and we signed a contract with a little Brown and I get the list of dates that this, 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 and when things will happen and when it goes to the managing editor and when it goes here, you know, and blah, blah. when you sell to a small art house, there is no big giant list <laughs> of, there's no giant procedure manual and so i i for, i said to bruce halfway through the process of publishing bookmark i said to him i god i yearn for that procedure manual because because <laughs> i know exactly what's expected of me at what stage of the process and where i'm supposed to be and this was much more free form maybe because cookbooks are highly illustrated and photographed they also have to have tighter schedules because you're dealing with art and design and recipes. All books, of course, are designed on the page, but recipes have to literally be designed for the page. Yeah. And um, I, I doubt, no one certainly in Bookmark ever said to me, you got to cut three, three lines here because it's running over to the next page. <laughs> As opposed to in a cookbook, that's all you ever see is cut five lines, cut three lines, cut two lines, you're running over a page. And, you know, the, the recipes are designed to lay out on pages and be formatted as objects. So it's a whole different game. It just fully works different totally game. different parts of your brain, too. Yep. It yeah. Does. It really does. I was going to, we were going to take some questions in the final 15 minutes, and we've had some come in. So I was going to pose those to you, Mark, if that sounds good. Some of the ones okay. people put it up. All right. So... Fee has asked, when did you start to write the memoir and when did you finish? So essentially, how many years did the transition and work on Bookmarked take? Um, it took, I wrote it for about four years. I think I worked with Genevieve for a year, year and a half along in there. Uh, it took four years to write it. 
partly because our career was it was going crazy with cookbooks and partly because it took that long for me to figure out how to tell the story. Um, and then it took two years for it to get placed, yeah. for it to be published. So it it was a long, involved process. It, you know, it's just, and this is hackneyed advice, but it's just not for the faint of heart. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I'm on a lot of uh, great Twitter feeds with a lot of poets and writers and a lot of poets, because I run a poetry podcast, and a lot of poets. And they all say the same thing, you know, like they, they actually have parties for their first hundredth rejection. When they get the hundredth rejection, they'll have a little Twitter party because I got my hundredth. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and they're, you know, I mean, some of these are really well-established working poets. Yes. But, but you're still getting rejected and you're getting pushed out. And um, it, it's not that you don't ever want to have a thick skin. You want to feel it. And you do. You want to feel what it feels like. You know, it's not a matter of being callous, but it's a matter of picking yourself up and doing it again, and picking yourself up and doing it again. And and it's it's a it's a tough process and a long process. And learning to take from it what's valuable, and let go what's not. Like you had mm. sent me a piece you have forthcoming where you talk about whether you read your rejection letters from publishers or not, and I found that. It's such a question. Yeah. Some people just absolutely. And I actually don't always think it, it, if it builds you up, great. If you're going to change stuff, great. And there's feedback in there that you can work with, but if not, you've got to keep pushing on. And like you said, you don't want to become thick skinned, but you also don't want to totally destroy yourself in the process because there's so much inherent rejection. And, and I have the luxury, the true luxury of having a good agent. And so she, she's the bumper on the car, as I always say, um, you know, uh, there, there's a bumper to this car and it's, and, and it means she, there's, she does a lot more than that, but I mean, there's a way that she helps protect me too from the process. So it's, it's good. It's, it's, it's hard. It's long. It's exhausting. But in the end, I swear, it's just overwhelming to hold a book in your hands and think that you wrote it. I, I think that with cookbooks and this book, more so I was hired to read the audio book of my own book, which was just absolutely insane. And I um, read it and it was just this overwhelming experience of sitting in a booth, reading my own book. It felt like the true end of the process that I yeah. was sitting in a book, in a booth, reading the book. And it was just, crazy a book about how books controlled my brain and now my own book is controlling everything I do every day in this little booth. <laughs> but, but nonetheless it it felt emotionally like the end of the process for me it was a perfect place for bookmarked to end up mm. that mm, I think you making tapes again which for <laughs> when people read it you'll see the it's one of the first beats of the book so you were back to it yeah I was I didn't think about that but I was I was making audio tapes of books again and uh like god i never thought of that but you're right that's how the book starts is me obsessively reading the opening chapter of every literary reader's digest condensed novel that was in my parents house and recording my voice into a tape recorder to hear me read them strange way to yeah it is life is strangely forms its own narrative sometimes for you (laughs) sometimes it does (laughs) sometimes (laughs) <laughs> but Amy had asked, um, Mark, did understanding so much about the literary voices of the great classic authors help or hurt in finding your own voice? It's an awesome question. I think we hurt. talked a bit about this. Yeah. Hurt. It really hurt. Um, in the end, I was, the, the first drafts, I was so busy trying to be the smart boy who knew Henry James and who knew Charlotte Bronte and who knew William Faulkner and uh, you know who got Emily Dickinson that 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 I was actually ventriloquizing them at places and um, Genevieve was very good about <laughs> finding those places <laughs> where I was ventriloquizing Henry James and not writing about what Henry James was doing to my body and doing to my to, to my physical self not where it lived inside me and it, it actually all those years of reading 
I had to kind of jettison it. Once it, the book is a series of purges, and I think that the, the, I had to purge a lot to write the book. Then, which includes a series of purges um, as part of my story. Always want to be the la- always want to be the last Puritan standing. Always. So. <laughs> That's an American literary tradition for you. It is. It's totally. Read to British literature for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> you pretty much had asked too if um, was Mark's voice always so clear or did that clarity come over time? I think your essential voice was clear. Like you, you have your own, like even the, in the bio we were reading before, I was like, that's a Mark voice right there. But it was. Yeah, I should say that, that. Oh, yeah. I should say that that bio that Anne read of me at the beginning that she found on the Macmillan website, I wrote that. And when she read it to us before the webinar started, Genevieve said, Mark wrote, she's like, that's <laughs> yeah. your voice. <laughs> I was like, and it, yeah, it, it was like, I know that. I know that voice. But it was very much about actually in editing Bookmarked, I felt like it was about playing up your voice almost because there were times when you were letting the authors or the books you were writing about kind of take over from you or take you mm-hmm. over, which of course is the theme of the whole thing. So it was natural, mm-hmm. I think that it would come up in the editorial process, but it was drawing out your particular story and making your voice the dominant part of the memoir instead of letting the classic works kind of overrule you. And it, the voice that that is there is fragmentary. There's a lot, the bookmark is a lot of six sentence fragments and a oh, lot, of cla- a lot of clauses hanging all over the place. and. Uh, it's a fragmentary kind of jagged voice, which is, it's interesting that it's not my speaking voice and it's not, it's not my articulated voice, but it is definitely the way I write. It is definitely this kind of um, jagged twist at the end. I want a twist at the end of every phrase and I want, I, I don't want a verb in every sentence and uh, <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I want to just before I go back to the box questions, did you journal throughout your whole life? And were you drawing on journals and bookmarked or is this no. memory? Okay. Yeah. And there's a even weirder question here. Um, uh, not only did I not journal, but I have rarely read a memoir. I can, oh. I can count on one hand, maybe the number of men. I read Lucy Greeley's autobiography of the face. I read the Liars Club. Um, we've read a bunch of memoirs now in the Norfolk Book Club, but I have, we started in January and have read through a bunch of memoirs in the Norfolk Book Club this year, but that's the most, those are the largest set of memoirs I've ever read. And before I wrote Bookmark, I hadn't read very many memoirs. I, I, <laughs> I almost wonder if it would have gotten too much in your head. Like, mm. In finding your own story, well, and in thinking about your your relationship with books that you're exploring, like one of the things you did over the course of your life was just read a tremendous amount of literature in these tiny spans of time. Like you did it mm-hmm. at Taylor, you did it at Madison. Like, and so I I wonder if reading too much memoir would have kind of stopped you in before you could have begun with finding your own way into the genre. I was scared. Uh, uh, and Bruce pushed me at one point to go read some memoirs. You should be reading memoirs. Um, and I wouldn't do it. I was too scared that I would get a voice of someone else, like with my shrink. I would start trying to parrot something that wasn't mine. Uh, Bruce also encouraged me to listen. I've never listened to an audiobook. And he encouraged me to listen to an audiobook before I read my audiobook. I didn't. I just okay. went in and read it and read it the way I wanted to read it. I ended up breaking down and crying during the reading, um, which apparently they're keeping in for the audiobook. Um, I ended up being very emotional about it, but I thought to myself, I, I, I don't know. If I listen to some actor read some book, I'm going to parrot it. I'm going to, I'm a natural mimic and I'm going to pick it up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I don't want to, I want to try to figure out how to read my own book. Maybe I'm also just ambitious maybe i'm just really ambitious too. <laughs> not a know. bad thing not at all <laughs> even <No>. yeah <laughs> i don't think so yeah. and final how did you decide what to include and what to leave out as you were working oh gosh um <laughs> um how did um 
I guess just in sitting down to draft that first thing, when you were like, what parts of my life am I going to focus on? You, you do start, you're in middle school at the start of it. Hey, you're, you're in eighth grade, which is when you first yeah. start reading. Yeah. Um, it's true. It's, uh, I, 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 how did I decide what to leave out? It's a, I, it's a question that's tough to answer. How do I say it? It, a part of it was this story and the notion that the story had to have, God, it's such a banal word, had to have a point and that I had to find the things that made the point that, that led to, to a narrative arc. And I didn't want to include material that was too digressive or diversionary, which is then what I did at one point after one of your edits of the book. I went back to that. And I don't know, I, it just, you know, I mean, I just kept paring it down and paring it down and paring it down and trying to get it tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. And some of the events in the book are, um, I say this at the end of the book, they're rearranged. They don't exactly happen in the order in the book, finally, the way they, they happened in real life, um, because they needed to be kind of slightly torqued for purposes of narrative. Um, uh, and for purposes of, uh, of how it worked. Um, I, I, it seems in the book, for example, that I've left seminary when I meet my ex-wife in the book, but those are really actually overlapping events, but I kind of had to deal with the seminary passages and get those behind the story so that then when I met her, it could take its arc from there. So those that got makes- separate. The, that's got separated in a slight gap in the book and there's actually no gap that exists in real life there so um I, I, stuff like that is just putting story first i see i see that somebody is querying that there's a difference between that question yeah between the, the new york times article and the bookmark uh version of how bruce and i meet let me just say that the bookmark version is how bruce and i meet um it is the real <laughs> actual version i think you're talking about our wedding announcement in the new york times maybe unless you're talking about the story of the two of us that appeared in the lifestyle magazine but um if you're talking about our wedding announcement mm, that's very condensed i don't think they say that we met in an aol chat room or anything like the <laughs> yeah, actual truth of the matter so um <laughs> it's a great story it's of a moment in time it, it yeah. is it yeah. is it's it's the world of aol and it's that world doesn't really exist anymore and yeah. i think that that's i think you have to get comfortable with that when you're anybody's writing a memoir because i'm a i'm not writing a tell-all because i'm not a celebrity and i'm not connected to a celebrity so i'm not writing a tell-all and in the end events become and i don't want to overstate this but events get warped or condensed or caricatured or torqued slightly in order to tell as we keep saying to tell a story um in order to tell the story that is going on inside the book itself and i think that that sometimes that makes people uncomfortable but i think if you want to write a memoir and you want to try your hand in a memoir it, you kind of have to get comfortable with this notion that you're going to have to shape events and when life happens to you it doesn't have a shape generally i mean you maybe reading into a microphone gives my life a certain kind of <laughs> return shape but most events that come screaming at your face don't necessarily have a, a, a sphere or a square they don't have a shape to them and you have to be able to shape those events in order to tell that story whatever story that you want to tell um i it's probably true for novelists right i mean i I'm, I was about to, well, someone had asked in the chat, actually, what was next for you? And I thought it, it is true for novelists. And you are sort of putting together the early, early stages of a novel. It's not early. But, early stages. But it will be interesting, I think, because that's one of the privileges of writing and working on fiction is in my edit letters, I can suggest the wildest things to like direct the plot. And it will often be a brainstorm, but you can be you know, almost soap operatic in your suggestions to get the wheels turning for how a story can proceed in the most dramatic or dynamic way. And editing nonfiction or a memoir, you can't be like, Mark, what if you change it so that you actually start this part of your life 10 years earlier? 
that's not an option because it actually happened. And so that's the freedom of a novelistic work that you aren't going to have when you're working in memoir, even as you are trying to craft it to a story like we've been talking about. You can't fundamentally shift its its component no. pieces. No, no, I can't suddenly have an older brother. Yeah. You know, I mean, it would be great in Bookmark if I had an older brother who was an established author or something, or, right? And then it would be, it would have all this kind of great resonance that I was the younger kid wanting desperately for my older, and I, you could do that in a, in a novelized version of it, but it, I, there, that doesn't happen. That didn't really happen. And so I'm, I'm bound, but still, and nonetheless, you still do have freedom as a memoirist to tell the tale and it's your tell your tale to tell so um you have to figure out how to make that make sense on the page and as you say connect with the reader it's it's so hard to learn how to connect with a reader it it's such a craft i'm sure anyone who works in film anyone who works in music anyone who works in any of the arts knows this problem of of that eventually your painting has to be seen or your film has to be seen and it has to connect in some fundamental way with somebody hard one of the wisest pieces of feedback that i think made a appearance in multiple of my early reports to you is an agent had said to me early on when we were looking at a memoir like i understand why the author needs to write this but i don't understand why a reader needs to read it and I think about that all the time. It's such a good question to ask yourself. I think it's most useful if you're the author sitting down. Like, why does someone else need to read this? What are they going to get out of it? What am I hoping they'll get out of it? And how do I try to make those two meet? Like, how do I give them a reason to keep turning those pages? And I think about that all the time when I'm editing. Yeah, and I think you you wrote that to me. Yes. And it it was like a knife. It felt like a knife when you wrote it to me because yeah. I thought to myself, but wait, uh, it, surely it's enough <laughs> to just do it. Surely it's, it's enough to just do this thing. Isn't that heroic in and of itself? And um, I, it felt very, uh, well, knife-like. It felt like a cold knife, but it was good because I realized that just because uh, that that the importance of the process toward to me may not be the same thing as the importance of the process toward a publisher yeah. and toward a reader ultimately a publisher and then beyond that a publisher beyond that to a reader where how, how are they going to fit into this story into into this thing that i'm telling and I I, it, I remember it very well. I remember being, I remember having to take the dogs on a good long walk and, <laughs> and try to start thinking it out in my head. Okay, wait a minute. Just because you want to tell the tale doesn't mean the tale can necessarily be told to the reader. Yeah. Um, yeah how do you? Hard, hard. It is. It's that. all hard. But it <laughs> ended hard. with a wonderful book. So Thank you. I guess it, it, close, we could say the question more broadly, what's what's next for you? Here it is. There it is. And uh, let me say that um, this book, my book, it's available, of course, on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Um, it's available in place you can get books. But if you live in my part of the world, there is a case, there are there is a case of these books at Oblong Books in Millington, New York. And if you would like a copy of the book, you can bring it by the Norfolk Library with a note, and I am happy to sign it for you um, in any way that you would like that to be signed. Okay, sorry, I jumped on you. What, what you were saying something, Genevieve? Oh no, and I see. And um, I was going to sort of segue into the same place that you did, where people can find bookmarked with its wonderful, wonderful cover too. Yeah, I, I've said this, I said this to Genevieve and, and Anne before we started, I have always wanted to be a hot guy that lies around on books, so, um, <laughs> so the, the cover is just like kind of what I've always wanted to be, um, and uh, it, again, it's you can find it any place you find books, um, and the audio book of Bookmark is out on the 9th of November, Ooh. so it will be up and running on Amazon and wherever on the 9th of November. I think you can already pre-order it on Tantor, the the house that, uh, on the audiobook publisher, but it'll be up on Amazon too. Is that going to be um, an audible streaming or will it be actually a physical copy as well? Do you know? 
I don't know. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I don't know the answer. Well, some to that of question. them, I know some audiobooks are now only available on Audible, which means we can purchase them, but for the library, it'd be nice to have a physical copy if, if um, a publisher is going to make one. You mean like a CD? You CD, mean like a. Exactly, CDs. Oh, yeah. I have yeah. no clue. I'm sorry. No, um, that's all right. I'm, I can't wait to listen to it. I think um, yeah. listening to a memoir read by its author is going to be just, especially after this wonderful conversation where I have learned so much about Mark's writing process and about the writing process in general. Um, for a memoir. It's been just terrifically informative and, and interesting, deeply felt. Um, thank you both so much for, um, for doing this program for us at the Norfolk Library. You are elsewhere, obviously, but um, as I said earlier in my introduction, it, it is being recorded and um, it will be posted on the Norfolk Library's YouTube website um, within a day or two. And I'm also happy to send the recording to anyone um, who would like to just get the recording itself. So you can just email us and let us know um, that you would like it and we can send that to you. And um, thank, thanks to you, Anne, and thanks Genevieve for being willing to yes. do this with oh, me. Oh, it was thank such a pleasure. So thank you, Anne. Thank it was you. so nice to meet you virtually and I hope we can meet in person um, at some point, Genevieve. I would love that. Your library looks so beautiful. Yes, this is our library. On my to visit list now. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for attending this afternoon. Um, warm wishes to everyone. Stay safe. Hope to see you soon. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.